So uh, we are resuming the session with a short uh, tea break. So in this uh, we have uh, four speakers in this session and uh, I request uh, Amb Ambassador Majumdar to chair this session. Uh, first I will, I am introducing uh, all the speakers and then I will hand over to you sir. So our uh, first speaker in this session is uh, uh, Dr. Rajat M. Nag, former Managing Director General of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, concurrently, he is a Distinguished Fellow at India Nation, India's National Council for, of Applied Economic Research, <coughs> NCAER, in Delhi and at the Emerging Markets Forum, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. He also serves as chair, Lookist Council of the Indian Chamber of Commerce. He was a visiting professor at the Graduate School of Development Management, Asian Institute of Management in Manila, and uh, currently is a distinguished professor at the Emerging Market Institute at the Beijing Normal University, China. Dr. Nag serves as an advisor and board member of several organizations, including at the Action for Autism, a regional non-profit organization devoted to the cause of persons with autistic spectrum disorders in South Asia, and at Partnership for Transparency Fund, an international non-governmental organization dedicated to helping civil society play an effective role in the design, implementation, and monitoring of good governance and institutional strengthening program. Dr. Nag was the Managing Director General of the Asian Development Bank during 2006 to 13. His work has give, given him wide-ranging insights into the key development challenges relevant to Asia. His particular interest is on sustainable development and regional cooperation issues in Asia and beyond, aiming to bridge the gap between the region's thriving economies and the millions of poor people being left behind. Reflecting his thoughts about Asia's future, he recently authored a book, 21st Century, Asia's Question Mark. He holds engineering degrees from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and the University of Saskatoon, Canada. He also has an MBA from University of Saskatoon and MSc Economics from London School of Economics. He was awarded Doctor of Laws by University of Saskatoon, Canada in May 2016. Another speaker uh, is Mr. Sabe Sachi Datta, who is Executive Director and Founder of Asian Confluence. Uh, Sabe Sachi pioneered the third space philosophy of the Asian Confluence, whereby through a host of programs, the Asian Confluence provides an opportunity for civil society to enhance people-to-people -people contact between India and her neighbors and also encourage a better understanding of the cultural and socio-political issues of the region that actually are the driving force behind policies such as India's actist policy. He leads the Asian Confluence in several Track 1.5 and Track 2 initiatives, speaks at several prestigious fora, the NADI, which is Natural Allies in Development and Interdependence, uh, River Dialogues, conceived and executed by the Asian Confluence, is now a premier track 1.5 dialogue on regional cooperation in the Bay of Bengal uh, region in partnership with government of India and other neighboring countries. He is a co-author of International Union for Conservation of Nature's Civil Society Organization's vision document for regional cooperation on rivers in the Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna region. And um, Sabe Sachi Datta is also an Asian Confluence, is a MOU partner of Nalanda University. Uh, Dr. Biswanjit Singh is an assistant professor at the Manipur Central University, specializing in international trade. He holds a postdoctoral fellowship and PhD from Beijing. His research interests include topics related to trade, liberalization, economic development, and the economies of East and Southeast Asia. He has also presented research papers on topics like trade creation, diversion in the India-ASEAN free trade agreement and agro-food trade in Northeast India. And he brings a very rich perspective from India's Northeast region to this uh, discussion. And finally, we have uh, Professor Sridhar Datta, um, to whom I am known since uh, my student life. We were uh, reading her articles and books when she was working with IDSA. 
Um, currently, she is working with the Jindal School of International Affairs, OP Jindal Global University. Earlier, she was senior fellow and heading neighborhood studies center at Vivekanand International Foundation. She is also a non-resident senior fellow with the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore. Prior to that, she was director Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies, Kolkata for six years and held fellowship with the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis among other institutions. She has a PhD from JNU and MPhil uh, from Jadavpur University, Kolkata, and uh, where she completed her graduation and post-graduation. Um, her recent works are titled Actist Policy and Northeast India and uh, edited Bimstek, The Journey and the Way Ahead, and Coed edited Bangladesh at 50, Development and Challenges. These are just few illustrations. He has authored many books and um, several journal articles, which are read by all who are researching on South Asia and Bay of Bengal region. Her research interests include India's neighborhood policies, regionalism, and cross-border issues, among other distinctions. She has been recipient of international fellowships, including at German Institute of Global Affairs, Distinguished Indian Scholar Series, University of Taiwan, International Leadership Visitors Program at USA, awarded the Selton Kodikara Award for South Asian Strategic Studies, and uh, many more such distinguished awards. So with this uh, introduction, sir, I uh, switch over to you to chair the session. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chaturvedi. So let us uh, kick off immediately uh, without further ado. And I give the floor to Dr. Rajat Nag for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, uh, distinguished colleagues from the panel, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this colloquium. Great honor for me to be here at Nalanda. Uh, to talk about an institution uh, about which I feel a particular nostalgia. And the reason is that, uh, just to give away my age, I was present at the founding meeting of BIMSTEC on June 6, 1997, that uh, Secretary uh, talked about. Uh, so I've seen BIMSTEC being born and grow and grow into a fine young person. Uh, it did get off to a rather slow start. Uh, for various reasons, uh, one of them being the onset of the Asian financial crisis within three weeks of it being born. Uh, so that was a challenge. Uh, but then uh, gained momentum, particularly after the 2016 COA summit, and uh, is now, I believe, at a very critical juncture uh, in the global context. Uh, but before I do that uh, and offer my thoughts, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to express my highest appreciation for the great work done uh, and being done by the Beamstech countries and the Beamstech Secretariat. Uh, I know that they've faced many challenges, political, institutional, financial, uh, and it has not been an easy journey. So I speak here today as a longtime friend and a long time supporter of BIMSTEC and regional cooperation. Uh, and it's in that spirit, uh, Mr. Chairman, I pick on a theme that you mentioned uh, in which you outlined the various uh, achievements and uh, opportunities, but also you noted the challenges uh, that uh, BIMSTEC faces. And I'd like to draw on my experiences of working in regional cooperation, uh, BIMSTEC, GMS, ASEAN, and uh, point to some. The, there are five challenges, uh, Mr. Chairman, in my view, uh, and I'll mention them not in any particular order, but the first one, I think, is the changing global geopolitical context. Uh, in a fundamental sense, the genesis of BIMSTEC in 97 was really the geopolitical realization uh, that BIMSTEC would be a good intersection, almost a natural intersection, of India's Act East policy and Thailand's Act West policy. And uh, BIMSTEC was really 
conceived at that time, and rightly so, as a bridgehead connecting South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, and the geopolitical context, global geopolitical context at that time, really, and this was immediately after the end of the Cold War, so I would say it was almost an infectious sense uh, of belief and optimism in the power of globalization, regional cooperation, a uh, feeling of regional cooperation being a win-win situation. Not that everybody would win the same. Some would win more than others, but everybody would win. Uh, and as I mentioned, the 97 financial crisis hit almost three weeks after Bimstek was born. And I remember there was a huge concern in our minds whether the child would be stillborn almost. As it happened, it actually was the best thing that could happen for Bimstek. And the reason is that the countries came together realizing that to weather that crisis, you really had to be together. Uh, Japan, of course, was a bulwark, provided huge amount of funds, and the result was the so-called Chiang Mai Initiative. China played a very important role, both by refusing to devalue the yuan and providing a huge fiscal stimulus, which sort of saved the day. So coming out of that crisis was a feeling that BIMSTEC has a very important role. I mean, these sets of countries have a very important role. And it sort of moved on. And we celebrated this 25th anniversary a couple of years back. And the chairman has mentioned about various uh, initiatives. And you know, your summit meeting in Bangkok in September will be a major hallmark. The situation now, sadly, is vastly different. Uh, Europe has perceptibly shifted to the right uh, with greater skepticism about globalization and regional cooperation. Uh, and without trying to flatter our guest and friend from Germany, I think Germany is probably the only exception which has again held the sort of, you know, tide. Uh, but we'll see for how long that lasts. Uh, Brexit was obviously a classic example of, I think, Britain shooting itself in the foot by leaving the European Union in that fit of feeling that we are better off shutting our shutters than being open. Uh, ditto in the US, uh, which in my opinion, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very conscious that I'm speaking in the presence of the people from foreign affairs with your depth of and breadth of experience, but still my thought, that the US is increasingly becoming, in my opinion, unreliable partner. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid will be dramatically more so if Mr. Trump were to be the next president of that country. So Europe and US are increasingly pulling down their shutters, uh, pursuing a rather narrow vision of national interest. China is pursuing, uh, even aggressively at times, uh, a challenge to the concept of a unipolar world uh, led by the US, to perhaps a bipolar world of G2, China and US, and some fear maybe also a unipolar world led by China. I, I don't subscribe to the last point, but that's certainly a, a concern. Uh, but it is certainly, uh, I feel, China's view that a multipolar world of equal partners is not their priority. I could be wrong, but that's the way I see it. Uh, and at least that is the fear in many quarters, particularly uh, in the Southeast and Northeast Asia. And it again comes back, uh, Mr. Chairman, that many countries in Southeast Asia, the smaller countries which are very dependent on the largest of China, always say, India, please make sure you always stay in the game for the reason of this balancing. So, and of course, India and China have major bilateral issues, particularly in the border security to contend with. So, we are seeing a much more complex geopolitical, global geopolitical situation 
where regional cooperation is not the natural course of action for the world at large. Uh, and therefore, within that space, BIMSTEC, I think, will now have an even more important role to play. Uh, I believe uh, that Asia still is probably the exception where there is still a recognition that regional cooperation is good. And again, uh, the secretary would be the best person to talk about it. But eff efforts of countries like India and even China, even this perspectives may be different, do speak of greater cooperation in a geopolitical sense. So it is in that context that I believe that BIMSTEC faces a very complex geopolitical situation, but in again an ironic way, a more important role for it, because it has to sort of really serve as the bridgehead between Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And Asia, in turn, I think has to play a very important balancing role, not only because of its growing economic power. The, it is true that the uh, global center of gravity of economic power is gradually shifting east, and India is going to be a major economic power. But also within Asia, BIMSTEC will have that role to play. Now, how the BIMSTEC countries will navigate itself through these difficult waters I think is a very major challenge over the next decade or two. So again, that's something geopolitically that we'll obviously have to contend with. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the second challenge that I see is funding. Uh, the uh, BIMSTEC Secretariat, together with the Asian Development Bank, recently concluded, I think, a very well done, thorough study, which is the Master Plan of Transport Connectivity. Uh, identified 267 flagship projects for a total cost of $124 billion. My own assessment is that it's on the lower side, quite frankly. But still, I mean, it's obviously, uh, and only 50% of that amount has been spoken for. But that too, nominally. So funding is obviously going to be a challenge. But uh, I don't think funding itself is a constraint. Uh, I felt that uh, there is enough funds globally available. Uh, from multilateral, bilateral, particularly the private sector. The challenge, I think, is in preparing projects. And I remember when I was at the ADB, I used to get calls at least one, or maybe even two a week from large pension funds, large investors, private sector in Europe and in, the, and in you know, Canada and USA basically wanting to invest in infrastructure in Asia, including in the BIMSTEC countries. And their question always was, where are the projects? And on the countryside, it was always the question of where is the money? So the challenge I felt and feel even more strongly is that we do not have adequate preparation of projects. Projects have to be, projects cannot be just a thought or a, or a wish or a nominal list of a flagship project going from A to B. They have to be prepared to bankable standards. They have to be, there's to be feasibility studies, there's to be digital engineering design, there has to be social and environmental impact because nowadays you can't get by without doing that. And Mr. Chairman, uh, very frankly, most of the countries uh, in, in BIMSTEC, certainly the smaller ones, and even within India, excepting for some large uh, you know, institutions, lack the capacity to design projects to international standards. And one of the reasons is that preparation of those projects require a huge depth of knowledge, which many countries do not have. I think it is easy to mobilize a billion dollars for a project but it's difficult to mobilize $10 million to prepare the project because the preparation of these projects are costly. So my suggestion, Mr. Chairman, is if BIMSTEC would consider prep a project preparation facility, 
let's say, of 50, 60 million dollars to prepare projects. And you really have to help the countries to do that. And if those projects are prepared well, the funds are there. So quite frankly, I think most of us chase the wrong end of the stick when we say funding is the constraint. I think it's the project preparation is the constraint, and then money will come. But having said that, uh, I also feel that hardware, i.e. building the roads and building the power plants, difficult as they are, the challenge is equally important in the company software. And uh, Mr. Secretary had alluded to that in his speech this morning when he talked about border crossing, when he talked about standards. And those also need a tremendous amount of preparation. Uh, case in point, negotiating the Bimstech MVA, the Motor Vehicle Agreement, which was started in 2018 or 2019, is still on the cards. And people say, oh my god, this is too late. My view is, it is not, it is very, it, yeah, it could, have, could have gone faster. I remember negotiating a GMS transit treaty and a motor vehicle agreement, and it took us good seven years. But the reason it took us seven years and is taking now the MVA to all of this time is again lack of capacity. There is an asymmetry of knowledge. You are dealing with lawyers on the other side who take us to the cleaners, and I don't blame them. They are looking after their interests from other countries. Myanmar sits or Cambodia sits on the other side, and the easiest thing to do when you don't really know the details is to say no. That is where I think, again, BIMSTEC as, as an institution can help on preparing those documents much more carefully. I have seen motor vehicle agreements, other agreements being drafted weekly, and therefore not proceeding. But also another issue, Mr. Chairman, and I say this because you know we have the great opportunity of having Secretary Emia himself here. So I can say it to him. Uh, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, AIIB, I all, and I can speak, well, I can't speak for ADB either anymore, but I know how it works. We would be, I keep saying we, they, would be very willing to support these efforts of project preparation of this. But the way the multilaterals work is that they can only work on the request of the government. And their counterparts usually, 99% of the time, is the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance ultimately says to ADB, do projects A, B, C, D for us. And either the bank says yes or no. And in my experience, I have had to push governments, including, sir, even in Delhi. <laughs> Where are the regional projects? Why aren't you asking for a regional project? We'll support you. And they say, look, we know you are very keen on regional for projects, but I I'm interested in national projects, and I don't blame them. That's their national priority. There is much more political capital in building a road in Bihar than trying to build a road from India into Bangladesh. Now, that is a reflection of the priorities within a country. And that is where I think the governments have to walk the talk on regional projects. It's one thing to say there are 267 flagship projects, 124 billion. But if those projects are not presented to the multilaterals, obviously it won't even get past the first base. So I would urge that the countries, not just, I'm not speaking just about India, all countries really have to decide on the priorities for regional projects as much as they say, I'm not saying at the same level as national, but as much as the same. Uh, let me uh, go to the third constraint that I see, challenge that I see, which is trade and investment. And again, uh, we can all, and rightly so, take pride in achievements made, but uh, 
I think trade and investment is still a major challenge for both sides. Uh, a major goal of any regional cooperation project ultimately is to see if those projects have contributed to the economic well-being in that country. When I say economic, economic stroke social. And a good proxy usually is in, in, the, in the field is to measure the effect of cross-border projects on the intra-regional trade and investment. How much as a result of this cross-border projects are you trading amongst yourself? Uh, on that score, BIMSTEC falls short. Uh, now, of course, there have been improvements. In 2000, at the turn of the century, the level of intra-regional trade within BIMSTEC was 3.79%, which means less than 4% of the trade of the BIMSTEC countries was with each other. They were trading with far distant, uh, but among themselves. 20 years later, 2020, 2019 to be precise, that number had gone up, but only to 7.2%. To me, now that's not good enough. Now my BIMSTEC friends tell me, and of course then I have to agree, that you're somebody to talk from South Asia, your levels are 5%. I said, look, I don't speak for South Asia. I'm speaking for you. 7.2% in 20 years, up from 3.2, no, sorry, 7.9 is not good enough. BIMSTEC should compare itself to ASEAN rather than South Asia, which is a laggard. We know that. And for ASEAN, that figure is close to, well, it's greater than 25%. So the trade connectivity and therefore also the investment has not happened. And interestingly, it has not because there are high tariffs. The tariffs have come down considerably in all of these countries. It is, again, what you uh, referred to, is really the high non-tariff barriers, the behind the border, the phytosanitary conditions. I know of cases where you, know, you can't take mangoes from you know, A to B, because somebody will has say, ah, but my standard says, and it has to be shaped like a, uh, you know, S and not a P or whatever. Uh, and that's a problem. A BIMSTEC FTA, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know there are lots of discussions in Delhi on the cons of FTA. But now that India has decided to drop out of RCEP, and that's a separate story, I think it, it's a shame, but that's a separate story. The point is, FTAs give the right impetus for greater trade. And FTAs can be designed in a way to protect your interests. For example, in the BIMSTEC FTA, there is still inconclusive views on rules of origin and services trade. And there, I think the BIMSTEC as a secretariat can play the role. Countries have to realize that in intra-regional trade, you can't have it all. If you want, if you are, say, Thailand or Sri Lanka or whoever, if you want access to India, largest market, you have to give something in return, and that something in return is services. India wants access to services, legal services, medical, whatever. And those two issues are still a major, major stumbling block. And uh, I just hope very much that the ministerial meeting and then the summit creates this deadlock on FTA. BIMSTEC FTA, I think, is an existential opportunity for BIMSTEC, and it's not happening. If it doesn't happen, then it also has a negative consequence. Uh, there are still uh, some missing last mile connectivity problems, uh, but the greatest challenge, again, for uh, limited intra-regional trade uh, is the institutional capacity issue. Uh, in the excitement of thinking about regional cooperation, uh, we often forget that the capacity, human capacity in many countries are still weak. 
And even within the same country, and I'm thinking of India, the variation of the capacities are remarkable. The capacity in the ministries, and Mr. Chairman is not to flatter you in any way, the capacities in Delhi, in the ministries, nine ministries, including, of course, the, the, the Minister of Finance, Minister of External Affairs, are world class. But it is thin. You just go 100 miles out of Delhi to the state capitals, and I'm being brutally frank, is just not there. And of course, the same thing countries. So it leads to me to my fourth uh, challenge for BIMSTEC, and unfortunately, it is not talked enough. And I really wish that the, the BIMSTEC Secretariat and the, and the government state acknowledge cognizance of that, which is institutional capacity. Human capacity is not there to match the aspirations that we have in our vision statement and in our charter. It is not the lack of political will. I've been to countries where they want to do this, but they can't. They cannot come to the conclusion on a power purchase agreement of a hydropower project because they don't have the lawyers to deal with it. And ADB then had to step in many cases. But otherwise, the other side would take them to the cleaners. And as I said, the countries therefore take the safest way out is to say no. Uh, and uh, the issue of institutional capacity uh, becomes even more pressing for BIMSTEC when one considers the proliferation of so-called minilateral networking in the Indo-Pacific. One downside of the great interest in the Indo-Pacific area has been a proliferation of arrangements uh, which are minilateral, as I call them, uh, and uh, they have significant implications. Let me elaborate. Uh, in recent years, uh, the region has witnessed a virtual explosion of such minilateral, such as the US, Japan, Korea, Trilateral, the Australia, UK, US Security Pact, not to mention Quad, and not to mention the 14 member US sponsored uh, Indo Pacific Forum. Interestingly, and you know, when I'm in China, one of the favorite conversations from their side is always, What are you guys doing to us? You're all ganging up, uh, you know, you've got all these quads and deep idea. And then I have to hold my smile because I know it'll come. And I say, but look, right? I mean, that's what's happening, but you are doing the same. I mean, China, while it decries the formation of multinationals, is doing the same, and you can't blame them. They have the Lanchang Mekong cooperation framework. Uh, they have, as you know, sir, expanded BRICS, without quite frankly <laughs> the economic rationale for some of those. But the rationale is essentially some arrangements which on the surface of it is very attractive because they're flexible. Those minilaterals can respond much quicker than the multilaterals can. They are much more flexible than alliances. But because they're also opportunistic, they cannot be institutionalized. And I find that they depend very much on somebody at the top, the leadership, which is good, but also means that when the first person changes, that arrangement can fall through. I feel that it will be impossible and maybe not desirable to stop this minilaterals. I mean, if three countries want to get together, there's no reason that one should say no. But for BIMSTEC, the opportunity is to become what I call the mother platform. If BIMSTEC is strong enough, then BIMSTEC can be the coordinating forum for all. And that can be a real plus plus, because these trilateral, quadrilateral arrangements, the so-called minilaterals, one thing going for them is that large countries are putting in a lot of resources. And they can be then better mobilized, better managed, uh, and better sort of catalyzed for BIMSTEC if BIMSTEC itself was stronger. But quite frankly, at the moment, uh, BIMSTEC is not in a position to do that. But having said this, uh, I think it would be grossly unfair of me if I didn't also say that uh, 
I'm constantly amazed at what Bill Secretariat does, and it does so much with so little, quite frankly. Uh, and therefore, uh, its operating staff, its budget, is grossly inadequate for the mandate. I mean, look at, I mean, as I said, constantly amazed at how they do it. And I know that, sir, your, your office <laughs> does a lot of hell, but still. So uh, my fourth challenge on institutional capacity is to plead for more resources for BIMSTEC Secretariat and more resources on the institutional capacity building in the countries and even within the large countries, even within countries like Thailand and India, I would say there's a lot of institutional capacity that, that needs to be done. And my fifth and last challenge, and as I said, these are not in any particular order, uh, Mr. Chairman, is what I call anchor leadership. Uh, now, a challenge in any regional cooperation arrangement, and the time that I was in ADB, that was always a challenge. We needed to have a leader without appearing it to be the leader, because you know you want to maintain some face-saving things. But the fact is, BIMSTEC, like any other regional arrangement, like the EU or ASEAN, uh, needs a leader who will be willing and able. It's important. Uh, able means you have to have the uh, institutional, political, financial muscle to, to support. Uh, Germany plays that role in EU. Uh, Thailand plays that role in ASEAN. And uh, my submission, Mr. Chairman, is that like it or not, I believe India has to play that role in BIMSTEC. Now, I know that you are doing it. I mean, you know, there's no question about it. But uh, that's something that has to be done at an even larger scale as BIMSTEC goes into that next quantum level. Uh, and of course, it's not easy. Uh, but I don't think there is any option but for India to play this role of Primus and Perparis, the first among equals. The interesting thing is that we can't say this in a, we meaning BIMSTEC can't say it openly, but whenever I've talked with the other BIMSTEC countries, they say, I mean, why are we even discussing it? Yes, India has to play that role. Uh, so I don't think there'll be a major issue, but somebody has to do it, and I think it has to be India. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, as I said, uh, BIMSTEC is at a crossroads. It faces major challenges. I mentioned five, and there are others. Of course, my colleagues, I'm sure, will talk about it. Uh, but my own feeling, and of course, uh, those of us in the development business are born optimists because <laughs> we are in the optimism business. I don't think any of these challenges are insurmountable. But I also think that each of these challenges singly or in combination are quite frankly existential uh, for BIMSTEC. But of course, I, I wish BIMSTEC all the very best and wish you all the very best, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your ministerial meeting and in the summit and your great role in, in moving this forward. So thank you very much and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nag, for that uh, really commanding uh, survey of uh, all the issues that are before uh, BIMSTEC. Um, you know, the advantage of uh, having this uh, 1.5 kind of track uh, discussion is that there are many things that I cannot say which you can say. Not only from your vast experience uh, and your knowledge of BIMSTEC having been uh, at its birth uh, and all these years, your experience with dealing with such regional groupings, but also, of course, uh, from the vantage point of the many hats that you that you wear. So, um, uh, so uh, I did not intentionally I did not touch on the geopolitical context because uh, not the, because I want I don't think that it is important, but because I thought I would concentrate mainly on the region. Huh? But of course, you are absolutely right. The geopolitical context does impinge uh, on the region. Uh, the um, you are absolutely right also when you say that uh, uh, any such grouping, especially so BIMSTEC, uh, would require one or two prime movers uh, to be able to 
uh, take it by the bootstraps uh, as we all want it to uh, be. Um, and uh, I must say that um, I do notice uh, that now we are um, ready to do that um, without any hesitation or with any grudging kind of uh, feeling that, you know, oh, again, we have to shoulder the burden. So that, that, that is not there. So that is a very positive uh, feature that I notice. And I think that will go a long way in addressing the challenges uh, that you have mentioned. Um, because the will is, of course, the f most important thing. And once you have the will, uh, then you can mount, uh, surmount these challenges. Um, in terms of funding challenges, again, um, I assure you that uh, we are ready and willing. And we do notice that some of our par partners in BIMSTEC are also uh, stepping up to the plate in, in some respects. Uh, the challenge of project preparation is a, is a perennial one. And uh, we notice that in development projects that uh, we do all over the world. Today, India, we do projects from the Caribbean to you know, Africa to Latin America. Uh, in my own beat, uh, I have the IOR region, uh, BIMSTEC, of course, SARC. Um, ASEAN is also with me. Pacific Island countries is also with me. And the Caribbean is also with me. Latin America is also with me and Canada, but Canada, we don't do any development projects. Um, but so we see that uh, often the challenge is to, to be for the host government to be able to identify a project you know, that they would like us to help. They have many ideas, but to actually put together a project proposal. And so uh, often we just ask them for an indicative area and then we use part of our funding to do actually a DPR to actually see whether it is a feasible project or not. So you're absolutely right. Those, uh, those are issues. Um, capacity building, uh, again. So uh, we are doing, we are offering, I think, more than 300 scholarships for BIMSTEC countries. Uh, but I think you're right. We need to be uh, more focused in what areas we are offering those in. Uh, in terms of trade facilitation, you mentioned, we do a program uh, that is uh, 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 handled by ICRIAR on trade facilitation. So to help countries to understand what trade issues are, trade negotiations, what are um, the ways in which um, the world of trade uh, works today. So those are ways in which we are trying to um, socialize um, uh, the countries in the region towards uh, this area. Uh, rules of origin and uh, services, absolutely right. These are sticking points. So I don't, uh, I'm not very optimistic about a BIMSTEC wide uh, FTA anytime soon, um, unless we address those issues. But thank you very much. That was a very, uh, very um, incisive yet uh, extensive uh, uh, coverage of the issues at hand. Uh, I now turn to Sabya Sachi Datta. You have the floor. You are the executive director and founder of Asian Confluence from Thank Shillong. Um, uh, respected chair, uh, uh, respected uh, Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Professor Chaturvedi, it's uh, first of all a great uh, honor for me to be here uh, at Nalanda University uh, uh, for this uh, seminar. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, we had two very, very uh, illuminating presentations. Um, and uh, I would just like to sort of take a segue from what uh, Dr. Nag all the issues that he mentioned, and make it specific to a certain geography uh, of, the, of our country. Uh, uh, I, I represent uh, the Asian Confluence. We are a think tank. Uh, we call ourselves a think and do tank. <laughs> uh, from the Northeast, we are headquartered in uh, uh, Shillong. 
And uh, what I would like to do in the few minutes that uh, uh, I have this opportunity to uh, present is to present with you some of the uh, ideas or, or, or some maps that we have been uh, working on. Uh, so as a think tank uh, located in the Northeast, uh, what we have done is uh, shown that how the Northeast is linked uh, to several of India's um, uh, uh, various foreign policy initiatives. For example, the Neighborhood First, um, you know, the Act East policy. Uh, but this is driven by our geography. See, we are, uh, if we look at the immediate neighborhood of the Northeast, we are, uh, we are in the BBIN region, right? And if you just go a little further, we are in the, next to the Bay of Bengal. And if you go a little to the other side, you are linking to the ASEAN, right? And all of these are sort of building blocks to the larger um, context of the Indo-Pacific. So I just wanted to lay out that, you know, situate uh, ourselves where we think we are uh, coming from and uh, as I share some more thoughts with you. Uh, next, yeah. So I would like to draw a natural, this is how the nature, natural connect is, you know. You see Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, India, Thailand. Uh, all of us um, share a contiguity of uh, river basins. So if you look at it from the Ganga all the way to the Chow Praya, they are sort of contiguous river basins. This has, so, so the geography is such, and all have sort of the headwaters in Tibet. Uh, and, and so it ties us all together in a natural formation. It is not just geopolitics. It's a natural formation. Uh, often uh, I see, like if I, I was just in Kathmandu a few months back and some people were saying, is Bimstek an alternative to Sark, you know? So there are people like that, but I think we need to highlight more and more, it is not, but we need to highlight this fact that Bimstek is a, uh, the Bay of Bengal actually ties us, uh, the countries, in a, in a natural formation. Uh, and, and you can't beat nature. You know, if we are looking at climate change today, if we're looking at the glacier melting in the Himalayas, we have to look at it, Himalayas to Bay of Bengal. If you look at the health of the estuaries, uh, what's happening with ocean waste, uh, what's going on with, uh, you know, um, uh, the cyclones, disaster management, all of this ties us together. So beyond the geopolitics, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, there is a need for cooperation amongst these countries actually. Uh, in fact, you know, six of the seven countries that are part, if I even take Sri Lanka, which is, you know, say for argument's sake, it's a bit far away from the Northeastern perspective. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next. So there are immense uh, opportunities because of that uh, in areas like green hydrogen, hydropower, agriculture, forest, I've just named a few, tourism, freshwater security, inland water transport and coastal shipping uh, all together. Now we all know this, um, but I would, like to, um, I would like to come back to the point that uh, Dr. Nag made about, uh, you know, the fact that regionalism is uh, becoming less, um, less popular or whatever, whatever, however we say it. But if you look at the context of the region that I'm talking about, Northeast India, uh, you know, in the last week, I was in Tripura. Tripura's southernmost point, Sabroom, is 70 kilometers from Chittagong, the Bay of Bengal, you know. After that, I went to a place called Siliguri, which is next to Bhutan and Nepal <laughs> and Bangladesh, you know, in a radius of, say, 60 kilometers, you see. so. The, the natural formation is that this region, the states and the countries have to work together if we have to uh, provide for the livelihood, the security uh, and the, you know, the prosperity of the states. So the next, next slide please. Um, this is just a slide about the history of the Bay of Bengal. I think we have had, um, I, I don't have it here, but there was a time when you could take a steamer from Banaras, buy a steamer ticket in Banaras, 
go all the way to Calcutta, take a, take a steamer to Colombo and, and to Rangoon. You could do all that. So the bay was crisscrossable and uh, you know it was seamless in terms of even multimodal modality of transport. I uh, just wanted to highlight that, that we are not talking about something extremely new, but moving forward, next. Uh, this is just a, um, a, you know, a profile of all the land borders. As you see, there are lots of uh, borders each country shares with the other. But I've highlighted, of course, the reds, um, where we have, um, you know, the, I'll bring up the issue of Myanmar in a bit, but yes, we do have uh, issues with uh, Myanmar, borders with Myanmar, that is one. But also, as Professor Na Dr. Nag just said, trade facilitation at the borders, um, you know, uh, phytosanitary standard, a fish from sh Meghalaya cannot cross, um, you know, 10 steps to the other side or, you know, from Bangladesh to the other side because of lack of a testing lab, um, you know, things like that. So these little kinks on the way, which seem little, actually have very, very big uh, impacts on regional uh, trade. So I, my, my submission here is that, you know, the little things at the border of crossings uh, need as much as, uh, you know, as, um, as much uh, attention to detail as does the larger, um, you know, uh, building a larger uh, framework for, for free trade and, uh, you know, uh, in the region. Next. Next. Yeah. Uh, next. Uh, this is a map I just wanted to highlight. That this is a map we have prepared, actually. It's sort of a map of all the ports <laughs> that exist along the littoral of the bay and the Andaman Sea. Uh, <coughs> you see the Galatia Bay coming up. Uh, you know, um, there is the Matarbari Deep Sea Port. I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, which is being, uh, which is the, uh, which is actually a very big deep sea port coming out in in Bangladesh. Uh, and of course, there's the red, where is the Chowfu port, which is now uh, quite uh, uh, of dominance by the, the Chinese, you know, the built by the Chinese. Um, then there's the Indian, uh, the port, which we have uh, funded and uh, built in Sipwe. But this is a map of the future. You can say how the, uh, the possibility of maritime trades and routes in the uh, Bay of Bengal. Now, why I show this map is because um, I have shown this map to several of our chief ministers of the northeastern states. <laughs> and, you know, the immediate reaction we get is, oh, then how can we get uh, advantage of this kind of an ecosystem, you know? Uh, so it is very important as states of the various, uh, you know, uh, states in the region are doing their planning process. For the big picture to be there on what is the relevance of the uh, Bay of Bengal um, to the planning and development of the local economies of the state. Um, Tripura, for example, uh, next step, next fr slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so I would just go to one step further if I go a little detail in further. So if you see the Matarbari, uh, so you see the Ch uh, Chittagong port, Chattogram port, which is now heavily silted um, because of uh, extreme amount of uh, sand being carried down by the Karnafali river, of which is, it is the mouth. And it is going to become extremely difficult in the future for uh, big ships to come in. So there is a new deep, deep sea port being coming up now, this port is uh, around 120 kilometers south of uh, a place called Sabrum, which is on the map in Tripura. Um, now, as we speak, um, there are projects on the ground which are connecting Sabrum uh, to Matarbari, uh, both through projects of uh, the World Bank, the JICA. I think ADB is also doing uh, parts of the road, you know. So this is coming up as a... Uh, sort of a big corridor, game changing. In fact, the Land Ports Authority of India is now building a, uh, or almost has built a very large uh, land customs station at Sabroom. And uh, this is becoming one of the uh, sort of the game changing projects in the region. Now you see from Sabroom, Pragartala, I have a friend here from Silchar, from the 
you know, we were talking at breakfast. So you see, if you connect Silchar and onward, to all the way to Shillong and Guwahati and you know other parts, you suddenly have the entire northeast uh, kind of connected to the uh, larger Bay of Bengal theater, provided that all the and then there is Gelefu coming up in, uh, in 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 Bhutan. You know, there's a there's a new city of Gelefu which is being planned. Uh, there are a lot of people in Nepal who are looking southwards how to connect to the Bay of Bengal. So this could become a very uh, important. Now, uh, my submission, uh, Secretary Sir, is that such projects, uh, if they are discussed under the ambit of the greater connectivity of Bay of Bengal and the BIMSTEC mechanism, I think it, uh, it can allow a greater enthusiasm for many other partners, funders to come in. For example, the Japanese are funding in uh, the, the, the Matarbari port. Uh, so how can the larger uh, uh, donors and projects come in, in into making a project successful? I think the mood is that if one project works, then there is an ecosystem of you know replicability that this will work. So then it, it moves on. Next. Um, of course, this is again a map of the future of how Kolkata and Sitwe and this entire uh, Kaladan um, could could become a sort of a vibrant triangle. But as we know that uh, there are issues uh, and uh, we have uh, you know concerns on what is going on in Myanmar. So, which brings me to my next point, which is that um, uh, while, uh, if I may, uh, sir, uh, be your permission, say a few words on Myanmar, just because I don't represent the government and think time, so I can uh, sort of uh, speak a little bit of my mind using this opportunity, that uh, while India's stated position is that we have to speak to the authority, whoever is in authority in Myanmar, but the the, the fact of the matter is that, um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so if I just take this, the literal state, uh, the part of Myanmar, which is just bordering the Bay of Bengal, um, that is the, um, where, our, where the Kaladan is, the Kaladan River runs, as well as the Sitwe port is, which is the Arakan region of Myanmar. Uh, and this is a map I uh, got a few days back. In fact, it's dated 7th July. Uh, uh, the, the blue areas show that uh, are the areas which are right now not in the control of the junta. <coughs> so you see the entire um, stretch, um, you know, along the Bay of Bengal, much of it is not in the control of uh, the powers that are sitting in the center in, in, in Nepito. So it raises a question about uh, what next? Uh, what is the future of the, uh, I mean, who does one talk to? You know, how can BIMSTEC uh, uh, be a mechanism in which some pressure is put on to bring in the right stakeholders into the process of at least them informally even seeing the potential of what, what is possible, what is not, what are the risks. Um, I must say that if we look at the social, cultural history of the region, uh, this region has been with India, I mean, for a very long time. There used to be flights from Calcutta to Akyab. You know, there used to be the, the, the Buddhist connection, you know, uh, Bengali used to be a language in the in, in the king of the Arakan court actually at one point in the in, in history you know so this entire region is socio -econ socio culturally sort of tied up uh, but uh, right now in today's context can can under the bimstek mechanism these socio cultural um, factors be highlighted so that the natural connect uh, which exists amongst the people of the region uh, you know, the people of Arakan uh, or the people of uh, the area feel much closer to India, much closer to Bangladesh than to the other sides probably, you know. So can those, can those uh, mechanisms be highlighted? Maybe not as formally as part of the BIMSTEC process, but certainly in uh, think tanks or, you know, university connects or, you know, research in 
you know, uh, those kind of things. Uh, and uh, can more stakeholders be brought in to showcase how the people of the region are tied up with their history, culture, so that they feel that this is in their interest to be together. How do we keep us together, basically? Next. Um, so in, in summary, I would say that uh, a, a vibrant Bay of Bengal op opens up a panorama of opportunities for the region, but it needs much more branding. It needs uh, what is the value of the Bay of Bengal for, say, a region like the Northeast. Uh, needs further articulation, uh, needs uh, much more uh, analysis and much more uh, branding, I would say. Um, uh, you know, a, a few years back, I, you know, we've been part of many BIMSTEC working groups. And I remember uh, several years back, uh, one ambassador from Thailand used to say, is BIMSTEC, uh, 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 you know, how do we brand it? It could be a brand of soap also, you know, <laughs> or it could be, a, you know, something more, much more important. So like ASEAN, everybody knows. Everybody knows about ASEAN, you know, but why not everybody knows about BIMSTEC? Even the word, the recognition of the word itself. And then there's a lot of work being done on inland waterways, coastal shipping. As we speak, there's a lot of work happening. I think uh, the connection of these inland waterways uh, to connect to the Bay of Bengal would become very important. Highlighting the role of history on how rivers like the Brahmaputra actually connected as far off places as Chokham in Arunachal Pradesh to the Bay of Bengal for the timber trade or the tea trades. Those narratives should come up much more and more in the curriculum of schools, colleges, universities. Um, and uh, for example, the new projects such as the Magarbari port, the projects are that uh, those that brings in uh, much more maritime domain awareness is essential for the non-maritime region. Um, creating regional value chains in goods and services can revamp. There's a lot of push in the region around uh, agricultural products. There's a lot of complementarity of agricultural products. Um, we in Meghalaya, for example, I'm headquartered in Meghalaya. We get, you know, I got a request for, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we also do the think and do part of it. We try to get businesses together and the chambers together to think of different ideas. And uh, so we got a huge uh, interest on tomatoes, for example. Tomato puree from J for I export to Japan, you know. So can, uh, there is a, um, as you know that there is the ACMP agreement in place, access to Ch Chittagong and Mongla ports, which allows any goods from the Northeast to access through uh, to the Chittagong and Mongla ports. But the problem is that it does not allow third country pr uh, exports. You can only go through Chittagong and Mongla to another part of India. So it makes the process very, very um, com complicated. There are ways to avert it, but uh, it makes it extremely cumbersome. So uh, even at a bilateral level, if a third country trade allows, Bangladesh allows third country uh, export, I think that would give a big fillip to countries like Bhutan and Nepal and northeastern states of India to export through Bangladesh. And that creates a sort of a mood and energy in the business community to further um, you know, look at um, the possibilities and, you know, uh, in the future maybe of, uh, you know, a much more vibrant uh, trade in the BIMSTEC region. Uh, next, um, and my last, uh, 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 sir, we are very uh, honored and happy to have a, a, uh, an MOU with, uh, with uh, Nalanda University. I think uh, this is a very, uh, a symbol and a, uh, of, of the region, you know, uh, as you said, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And uh, I would add the previous one line, Udara Charitam Eva, those who are the broad-minded, for them the world is one global family. And this institution of learning um, actually exemplifies that. And uh, we think that much more awareness of the Bay of Bengal study uh, center, Bay of Bengal is essential in that part of the country and we are happy to work with you to take that forward if, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, consent and support of the Ministry of External Affairs. Um, there is also already a BIMSTEC network of universities, I think, but if this could be made more vibrant, uh, BIMSTEC network of museums and universities, um, uh, inclusion in the school curriculum of 
various subjects regarding the history, the culture of this region. Uh, there was a Bimstek sports meet, I think, a few weeks back. I think that went off really well. Uh, one of our scholars has even just written about it. Um, it's, it's, it's given a very good momentum. So I think, as you said, sir, a lot of more emphasis on people-to-people -people, uh, connections is important, highlighting the natural contiguity. Um, and uh, also, uh, things with collaboration, for example, with the SASIC program of ADB. I don't know if, uh, Rajat, sir, that is something that is, you know, it's a natural sort of a progression of uh, how, um, you know, as ADB tries to do more in the SASEC, can the two synergize? Um, there was a BIMSTEC uh, network of tour operators, sir, a few years back, which we were very, very enthused about. And I think if that could be revived post-COVID uh, with much more gusto uh, and uh, the Buddhist circuit, in the, even with Nalanda and everything could be uh, sort of revived through this BIMSTEC uh, uh, network of tour operators, include places like Tawang in Arunachal and, you know, Lido and all these other places. Um, I think that would be a, a great fillip uh, to, uh, and, and these are already mechanisms which exist. But I think it needs uh, some sail, uh, wind under the sails, as they say, to, to sort of take off, you know. Uh, and we are all looking forward to, um, you know, uh, after the summit, uh, you know, what more can happen and happy to participate. And of course, uh, as we see, uh, many of our parliamentarians in the region, uh, or even not uh, parliamentarians, even if you say, or the local MLAs, um, they are not very aware of the potential of the Bay of Bengal, the region. But they do dictate the political narrative. Uh, they do dictate uh, the narrative of, uh, you know, what goes on in the local areas. Um, and so, uh, in fact, a uh, few days back, sir, uh, there's a new MP from Tripura uh, uh, she, uh, who is th from Sabroom. Um, and uh, they belong to the royal family of Tripura. So I met her. I was telling her that, you know, in fact, her family had, you know, the kingdom of Tripura, in fact, extended all the way to Ava in Myanmar, and, and they had relationships with uh, Chittagong and uh, Dhubri, and you know, the kings used to keep their own equations. Uh, the king of Chittagong was married on one side to the prince of Pegu and the princess, uh, you know, and on one side to the royalty of Tripura. So they, uh, they had ways to balance out and keep their region as, uh, sort of together. I think those formats need to be, uh, to be revived uh, in, the, in the current politics of today. And I was telling her about the opportunities in Sabrun because she's the parliamentarian from there. But sadly, uh, I found that the awareness about the opportunities that Sabrun presents, which is her constituency, was very limited. Uh, you know, hardly any awareness of what is the possibility. So I think there should be forums uh, where uh, parliamentarians and MLAs and local leaders should be uh, educated on the various uh, aspects of ongoing projects and the possibilities where they can show dreams uh, and also uh, dock into the efforts underway. And also with academia and media community, much more process in the media, I think, is necessary. Um, the media does dictate and drive a lot. Uh, and I think local media needs to be much further enthused. Uh, uh, and uh, I think as the process of the Boomstack Summit uh, sir, takes place, uh, I think uh, we need to have much more drum beating on the possibilities of, uh, of Bimstek and the Bay of Bengal in the media to, to solve the real uh, issues of the, of the today, not as a uh, amorphous uh, geopolitical construct, uh, but what it can actually do for the people of the region and create livelihoods um, today, basically. Areas like cultural organizations, to youth, tourism, I think they can all help entrepreneurs of the region. There are lots of young entrepreneurs. Asian Confluence, in fact, uh, um, so we are uh, cultivating a group of entrepreneurs across the region, young entrepreneurs. And if those can be you know, further enthused, that would be great. So these were a few of the ideas. I think uh, there is a next slide or not? Next? Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, there is, I would like just say that Maybe a BIMSTEC plus with Indonesia would also give it some natural contiguity. I don't know the equations on that, but 
there is scope for that of course in the new charter. Uh, but we share a long, uh, very close border with Indonesia at, from our Andaman seas. And I think uh, inclusion of Indonesia could be a, a very, very good, uh, uh, you know, step forward. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, I know, I'm sure it's al already under consideration. So on that note, uh, thank you very much for uh, hearing me. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. I think you uh, brought it out in a very graphic way for us to, you know, uh, put our heads to it uh, as to how BIMSTEC is such a natural construct and that uh, if it did not uh, exist, then we would have to, it has always existed in a way, um, and we are only putting some flesh and bones to what used to be uh, a region that had uh, uh, a lot of interaction historically, commercially, um, culturally and civilizationally. So thank you for that and um, I agree with you entirely uh, on many of the things that you have brought brought out but uh, I won't get ahead of myself. There are several of these things which uh, will be discussed at the summit and you may have some good news uh, coming out but you have covered several of the ones that um, I think uh, we will be bringing out uh, in the summit. Um, and also, you are right, uh, it's good to talk about it as a, as a region, as a, an idea, but one has to get down to a much more granular level to see what uh, are the you know, real nitty gritties that need to be done. For example, you showed us uh, the map with the uh, ports along the periphery of the Bay of Bengal. Um, one small thing which could uh, you know, enter into making it much more integrated in terms of the usage of ports and the movement of people is um, something that is called um, a near coastal void certification, you know, uh, which basically means that you certify vessels and seamen um, for near coastal voyages. That makes it so much cheaper for them. Uh, it costs much less in terms of when you are hiring a vessel for inter-regional trade um, the cost of the vessel is less, the amount you have to pay to the uh, crew is less, it makes uh, uh, trade much cheaper, uh, it facilitates more vessels coming into the you know, uh, near coastal trade. So these are small things, but we, so we are negotiating one with Thailand, uh, and that is from the Andamans, but I think it can be, my idea is that we should expand it to all the countries in, in Bimstek, which will really help. Um, yes, so uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, also the point that uh, Dr. Nag made which uh, I did not comment on earlier but you have also made how um, our projects within the Northeast for example, how they should tie up with our region, view of the region and how it should uh, um, mesh with what we have planned uh, in terms of our uh, transport and communication links in the in the larger region. I think that is something that um, is not being done. Uh, there is a lot of money and a lot of projects that uh, you know donor is uh, um, supporting, and the Northeast Council is doing. But that element of uh, uh, meshing with the regional um, uh, infrastructure uh, network that needs to be done is uh, has not happened. Uh, you showed the that map of. Uh, uh, the Arakan, but uh, I, I would just like to point out that if you were to do a similar map of the whole of Myanmar, it would essentially be very similar yes. because yes. Uh, uh, the fact is today that the Junta is in control of the um, urban agglomerations uh, because they are not really out there in the countryside and you will find the rest is not, it looks like it is not in their control. But really, actually, it is not in anybody's control, so to speak. But uh, the urban, urban agglomerations are where they uh, they control uh, the um, uh, administration. Um, so uh, I thought I'd just make those few comments. Uh, thank you very much. A very uh, uh, a very uh, nice presentation, even visually for us, you know, uh, with uh, with the uh, graphics. I now turn to uh, Dr. Vishwanjit Singh from the University of uh, Central Manipur University. 
Manipur Central University. You have the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, accept the PPT. Uh, first of all, a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, honor respected ch chairperson, and uh, respected invitees, professors, and students. I'm very thankful to the Professor uh, Razif for inviting me in this colonial. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about cross-border threat policy as a part of BIMSTEC and ACIS policy, and uh, and most of the some important point already be highlighted by previous speaker. So, as a student of economics, I would love to start with some data, and I'll come to point. Please next. Uh, this is a, some fact about Wimstack that uh, you can say the impediments that Sir Nago has already highlighted about the uh, intra regional trade is very low comparatively with other regions. I'll show you the data, how much it is. And uh, within the Wimstack member countries, we have identical comparative advantages in, in the types of goods we produce and export. That's the one thing. We are, uh, then. Uh, then shortage of exportable surplus, lack of communication infrastructure, restrictive trade policy, shortage of financing and a political dispute. Uh, and the structural impediments that some of already highlighted uh, by Sir Nag, but here is the manufacturing capacity across the region to absorb the material produced in the region. So uh, that's another. And the informal sector smuggling activities, uh, corruption, bribery, then currency conversion and transportation costs. So we are, India is also trying to be a uh, rupees internationalization. So I hope we have to use rupee to the cross-border transaction. Uh, that's a very important one. And uh, informal sector is very important regarding the boom stake. Is that uh, yesterday in the Indian Express, they have uh, highlighted, uh, point out the data about the, the uh, informal entrepreneur sector. So Bihar is in the third position Oh, sorry, fifth position, West Bengal, and so notice India economy is also dominated by the informal sector. So informal sector is very important, uh, I think, regarding the WIMSTEC. Next, please. Here is the intra asian trade all over the world. So in North America, 60% is, 60 is uh, intra regional trade. Eastern Asia is 31%, Southeast Asia, 22%. Saudi Asia is only 8%, uh, in two, and then BRICS, it's in a uh, billion, okay. And BRICS, 10%, European Union is 61%. So this is the major concern of uh, this export. And similarly, in the import, we, you see uh, that uh, then Saudi Asia, uh, Saudi Asia is the lowest one with a 5%, and other in double digits. So that's, ASEAN is also a major concern about low, intra regional trade, but compared to Bimstake, it's far ahead than us. Next, please. Uh, this is the intra regional trade that export and import by the Bimstake within the Bimstake means intra is only in 2010 it's 5%, 5.5%, and in 2022, uh, 2022 it's uh, nine, around 9%. Ex so it's increased, but as Sir Nag also highlighted, it's only 3% increase in these 12 years. So that's the export, and if we go to the imports, it's decreasing the 4% to 3%. So it's, this is a major concern of, uh, then if we see Bumstead export and import to other region, it's, we export more in East Asia and Pacific than within the Bumstead. That's, that's how it's happened. And next, please, here. Is the, my major concern is if we see the trade between India and China within the BIMSTEC mem member countries, uh, others, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, India has, exited, uh, has far be uh, performed better than China, but if we see Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, in spite of having FTA, China, why China trade more than India? That's the major concern uh, of, of me. So uh, let's see about some, uh, 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 the, uh, 
the, the differences between China's policy or Indian policy in respect to uh, border trade. Uh, next, please. Uh, one member's concern that highlighted in 1999 by Hindu is that Indian physical presence and action in Southeast Asia region has caused apprehension among its uh, smaller economy in the region. So we should not be, uh, I think this is, how, this, is, this is where India should, uh, should not uh, see in, in, in this way. As Professor Nagoto says, that lead the region without, without uh, seeing them as a leader. So therefore, India's region policy should be outward looking, non-exclusive, and multi-dimensional in, fun in, in, in function. And India should integrate with neighboring countries like ASEAN and region power like China, Japan, and South Korea, push the uh, Bangladesh and Sankan to connect the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, it could help in, uh, in, in uh, could help. Next, please. Now, motivation about the BIMSTEC is that uh, uh, the how to increase the international trade and how we can change the, uh, the, uh, the geoeconomics of the region is that India becomes a uh, economic powerhouse. If, uh, say, India is a developing country, everybody is saying, if we see the uh, well index, 10% of the well, well index of India population, it is twice as much as Britain population. So it's already a very powerful uh, country. Uh, if we, yes, uh, if we think about all uh, total population, we are developing countries, but when I say that it's a 10% of the top well index, we are far more uh, powerful than the even UK. So uh, there are differences, even though we have, say it's a comparative advantage, it's almost the same in every country, but there are differences in resource endowments in terms of, and price structure is there, location advantage, wage differences is there. So uh, well-educated and cheap labor are also available. On our side is a very skilled and educated, their side is, is, the, is, is opposite. And their chief labor is the main driving factors of globalization and global value chain in this uh, industrial 4.0 era. So uh, true, and another is that when we see Myanmar, it's very, there's an interesting fact is that Myanmar be, uh, converted its periphery border in areas into country's center of growth. For example, the per capita income of the uh, periphery areas that border with China and Thailand is far higher than the people living in Napito and Yangon. So why not we should use that kind of policy in, in India? So border areas no longer survive at the mercy of the center's aid and assistance. That's, that's the motivation uh, that we have to look on the one, one framing the policy or border policy in India. Next, please. Okay, if we actually if we think about also some border trade data where why China and Myanmar has uh, Thailand, chi uh, China and Myanmar has more trade than India. But if we look the reveal competitive advantage and the number of products that we exported to the world, in, India is not far behind with China. China has offered 256 products, India offered in 252. Bangladesh is the third, uh, also produced to 226, and Thailand being the th second one, 254. Others are one, uh, 74. But we, we see the number of products that India has a competitive advantage is 94, which is the third column, number of product. Okay, so 94 India has a competitive, 94 product, India has a competitive advantage and 106 by China. So it's not that much different. But why, why they have, okay, they have more trade with Southeast Asia than India. That's, that's the concern. And if you see the concentration in that, which means India is 0.18%. That means India is very diversified. And China 0.1. Others, the higher the value of concentrations index means that they are only focused on some few products. So, so here also, India is very diversified. So, uh, it, with compared to India and China, we are comparable. Okay, next please. Here, 
India. This is the uh, export of government and private sector of Myanmar to the world. See, if you see the data, uh, one is the government exported by the government, and the middle one is the pri by private and, or, and total. When in 2011, the government uh, export to the world 85% overseas and 15%. But after to, uh, the, to, uh, 20, uh, 2018, the, the, the scenario has changed. 90% export through border and 10% export to overseas. And it is because of the sanction and etc. But but they they shifted from overseas to the border quickly. This is how the government of uh, Myanmar is doing. Now, uh, regarding the private sector, overseas is 69% and 31%. Most of them are doing private sector in the in the border uh, since 2011 also. Right now, 31% still, 31% is doing by the private. That means when we do about a private uh, border uh, policy, that uh, government is very important, and more important is the private sector that we are we going to deal with this 31% by the uh, private sector. Please, next. Now, some trade scenario, I, I took 2020 as a, this is the normal area, uh, a year, that's why I, I took, I compare, uh, I took this year as a comparison. Myanmar's border trade with China, and Thailand reached 5 billion and uh, 622 million in 2020. India's border trade is only 200 million uh, with Myanmar. So Myanmar uh, border trade volume between Myanmar and China is 25 times bigger than that of uh, Myanmar and India, and three times smaller compared with Myanmar and Thailand. So, so uh, India's border trade is very, very marginal uh, if we, we compare with these two countries. Next, please. Okay, this is the scenario. So we have Aegis policy, neighborhood policy, we have uh, duty-free tariff preferential schemes. Uh, we have, right now, it's BIMSTEC also there. So in spite of all this policy, the, the border trade share with India is only 0 0.16 bilateral percent, not even less than one. If we go to uh, even say 2020, it's only around 3% export and 0 0.01 imports. This is import from uh, India, not uh, Indian uh, import from Myanmar, okay, the export. And so in the very short period of time, Bangladesh do better than India, if you see in the export and imports uh, from 0 0.17 in 2012, in, in, I mean the column of export to 1.71, and from 0 0.01 to 2.80. So uh, total trade is India was 0.2% and Bangladesh 2%. Now, another one is 32%, uh, the, the, the border trade has shifted, pattern of border trade has shifted from China to uh, Thailand in recent years, because of a lot of uh, uh, conflict was there also. But one point is that why Thailand and China has more volume of trade trade than India is that China and Thailand included petroleum and natural gas in the border trade. A huge trade was there on that. So that is a last volume is also highlighted there. Then another one is that there are a global value chain activities took place there in border with Myanmar and uh, Thailand and uh, Myanmar and China, but we don't have. So next, please. Uh, this is the uh, India-Bangladesh border trade. So same with only 2% presented by border trade within India and Bangladesh. That's why the major concern is. Next, please. Yeah. So increasing features in security uh, and security issues on the agenda. And we have regarding the Nordisk development, we have a debate of development and peace. Who will proceed? Some say development should proceed peace and peace proceed development. But I, as my personal opinion, I think development should took place and because we do not know peace will, uh, when will this all the political uh, conflict ends. So development should, should be there. Like uh, given Sarah also been in Beijing, China, so Whatever they do in Xinjiang or in Tibet, they never stop development. They develop Tibet and Xinjiang. It's more than the Beijing. 
if you see the in terms of infrastructure, anything, any facilities are provided in uh, Tibet and Xinjiang. What? So they never stop on doing that. So, so, so even if the Dalai Lama are powerful spiritual leader, so they do that one. So sometimes I think I think development aspect and perspective when they see the development aspect, they they change their attitudes towards towards the state. It's something like, oh, we belong to them rather than we. So there is a, a self-contradiction among them. So I think, sir, development project, and we should be happily focused on development. So for that matter, we need free flow of goods, services, investment, capital, and labor flow between the this. And we should have a production network linkages between the regions across and try to enhance boom cell capacity as a global supply chain, and I'll give you some uh, uh, some 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 potential products you can develop as a value chain linkages and create should create a rule based community of shared values and norms. Uh, next, please. So another thing. So what what's why uh, while dealing with this uh, boomstick, whether it ASEAN, we have to think these three. Uh, stakeholders, business community, labor community, and policy makers. I hope uh, most of them is happening between policy makers, like government, government to government, etc., etc. But we need business community, the local business community across the border is very, very important. To, so for that matter, we we'll have to uh, arrange exhibitions, trade fees very frequently. And then the labor community is there. So how do you use what kind of labor are there? What kind of labor are we here? So what kind of industry, uh, labor their industry required? What kind of labor that our industry required? And how can this labor trans, uh, uh, exchange could took place? So without, without, this, uh, without considering this labor community on both side of the borders, um, we have to consider on that one. And business community, of course. Then we should build on a small step, like I say, not a just a small exhibition, trade fees and exchange program, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Voluntary and informal arrangement could could arrange on that one communication and how do we make is the communication and inform, information flow. But but beyond that, we need the feedbacks. So feedback is very important while making the policy. So uh, then uh, we I think we have a trust deficit because of the history. So uh, we focus on strategic trust to overcome this trust deficit could help uh, accelerate the intra regional trade. Next, please. OK, this is the issue that you've been uh, prevailing in uh, regarding the cross-border trade uh, in Northeast India in general, uh, in particular. So lack of trade facilities, border infrastructure, limited access to finance, uh, then uh, limited inf market information, corruption and insecurity, limited knowledge and education and business management skill. These are the key uh, uh, the impediments of cross-border trade scenario right now. Uh, uh, then next, please. OK. So I think uh, what's wrong with in this border trade policy is that India has not placed its region in, in Resident economic integration policy through border trade in high conformity with its national industrial development strategies. I'm not talking about Northeast, but if you see Nepal and Bihar, uh, if you see uh, Pakistan and India and Bangladesh, and then I think we, well, there is uh, main trust has not been placed. Uh, I, I might be wrong, but uh, I, I, I think in th then that's why India's border trade is not bidirectional. Uh, then, uh, yes, sir, uh, there is institutional setup is less pragmatic and smooth. Like, uh, say we uh, we formalized border trade, indo myanmar border trade in 1995, uh, but uh, there is no internet, there is no designated bank at Moray. So before setting up the institution first, we just arrange it, open up the, uh, implement the policy. So when we implemented it, uh, then uh, nobody knows about the formal trade in 
the actual business doing with the who are small businessmen they do not know about the formal procedure etc etc so that's the uh, that's the institution setup is less pragmatic and india does not organize different business summit conference yes in the delhi or other big cities that is but not in uh, say in the in the border area so it will be easy to come and to meet there uh, at various level in say local province and government level uh, it's not happening. The Indian economy is not well integrated with the bordering uh, countries of Bumstake or ASEAN through supply chain linkages. Next, please. So these are the uh, say supply chain linkages of uh, Myanmar and uh, China in textile and clothing. They did craft business, rice, broken rice also, uh, electronic and machinery, building materials. They have supply chain, very close supply chain linkages with China. Uh, regarding with uh, the Thailand textile and clothing sector, education, construction, electronic and machinery and beer, they have a supply chain linkages and even uh, value chain linkages. Uh, next please. Uh, this is the garment industry that's happening in Mesut. Uh, we need the three pagodas pass. So around 5,000 Myanmar migrant workers working at the Thailand site. Okay, in the, they work they go to the factories in the morning and walking back in the evening. So along that, they bring their 100 children, okay, to study in the Thailand site. So students, parents got permission from the Myanmar border authorities to cross the border. And in the morning, they open, they let them students study in the Thailand education system, which is more better than the uh, Burmese. And they do not allow other residents to cross. So without, Myanmar's worker textile factors on the Thai side have been unable to run because it's chief labor. That's why I say labor community, how we can uh, change it. So this 5,000 Myanmar my, uh, workers is very important in terms of Myanmar's point of uh, job employment and income point of view also. And that's how they build the relationship. So any, by, uh, any, so some, these are the, these are the things that we can do uh, in our uh, Tripura and Bangladesh border, textile and clothing, and are also in, in Manipur and Myanmar border. And also another is the jewelry, then uh, uh, this, uh, 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 the, no, no, uh, the carpentries, that are happening, uh, the, the value chain took place happening between Myanmar and Manipur, uh, already been ha took, happened, but we have to formalize it through SEG or border development economic zone by building that kind of uh, policy should be there. Next, please. And so f for that matter, we need to develop a border economic zone, uh, whatever feasible may be in Nepal, Bihar borders, Bangladesh, Tipura, then Bhutan, then Nepal, so wh whatever possibility we need to develop uh, 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 a border development zone. Next, please. Uh, I need to, this is a policy, if possible, I like to have a hand-holding support policy here. Like India has a rich state and on the hand we have a poor state. So that means that uh, say uh, Bangarasra, Gujarat, Karnataka has most advanced than um, a Nordic state. So why don't uh, the businessmen and entrepreneurs from this rich state come to the Nordic state or we are or uh, okay in terms of uh, to undertake business activities that's a hell holding support and like in it in that manner we can it can have in the development of providing jobs in the state and increasing uh, look export of local products to the national market and global and it can also enhance skill and industry capacity of the poor state uh, is a i think it's a, it's it's a very much imp uh, important to have such kind of uh, policy hell holding policy next please some recommendation uh, quickly, uh, uh, please mainstream informal cross-border trade in a national and regional economic policy dialogue and identify this intensify cross-border policy dialogue to build understanding of local cross-border dynamics. I'll skip because of time constraint, I can skip it. Uh, next please. Uh, yes. Cup corruption practice at the border and checkpoints. This is very, very important. Support licensing of small traders. Uh, next, please. Oh, sir, uh, one more. I would like to add. 
if if possible, it's very much necessary, I think, to have a bilateral free trade agreement with Myanmar and India. It's it uh, if if the, this is it, it it will solve a lot of problem. It it can so uh, then next please. Uh, next, I'll do that. Okay, if possible, uh, in the BIMSTEC dialogue, establish simplified trade regime by designing programs suited for the informal cross-border trade, integrate uh, informal cross-border trade into regional trade policy, increase access to market information at key border points, uh, reduce documentary requirement, and put in place transparent procedure and processes, and, and, and make it, uh, please, uh, allow the rupee to trade cross-border. It will save a lot of money. We are settling through Singapore. If we directly do with RBI, then it will, we, we can save every transaction 30 to, 30, 20 to 35 uh, US dollar per, uh, per transaction. We will save it. Uh, next, please. Uh, for us, it's prioritized uh, as, uh, this informal cross-border trade in national development plans and add for trade assistance, provide support to uh, develop data and analytical capacity for the institution, I say, study contribution of informal network to cross trade integration, and understand the specific, uh, specificities of uh, broader market. Next, please. Uh, yeah, trade specification, I will not cover this one. I think one more slide is there. Next, please. Okay, I'll, I'll sum up. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is a very in-depth, uh, very in-depth and uh, um, uh, fu uh, one full of data uh, that you went deep into border trade and uh, how we are faring in terms of our border trade with uh, very specific geographies. So that was uh, very interesting and very insightful, I must say. Um, it's also interesting that you mentioned that uh, in the case of Myanmar, the periphery has become more prosperous uh, than the center. Uh, but we will have to go a little bit more deep into why the periphery is making so much money and how they are making so much money. Um, the case of uh, uh, ch the China is, uh, well, you make a valid point about development and that uh, uh, there cannot be peace and security without development. That's, uh, that's well uh, understood. Uh, the case of China, of course, uh, whether it's in Xi'an or in Tibet, um, I would uh, put a little different understanding uh, to that. Uh, it was necessary, uh, of course, you know that uh, uh, there was massive uh, resettlement of Han populations in both these areas, and it was necessary to develop them so that the Han population would feel comfortable. You know? So it was not entirely altruistic uh, <laughs> development uh, incentive. Um, uh, on uh, value chains, you are absolutely right. I think we need to map out uh, in our border areas uh, with our uh, sub-regional uh, economies, what are the value chains that work. Um, RIS has just done a, uh, a study which we are releasing during this summit on agricultural value change in the BIMSTEC region. So that is a beginning. I think we can look at other, you mentioned, uh, you know, um, uh, textiles and garments, for example, or, you know, other areas uh, uh, where we could look at uh, these um, uh, value chains. Digital payment system, I think it's uh, something we are looking at, a digital payment system within the region, which will make it uh, cheaper to uh, uh, make payment systems uh, between our countries. Um, so, uh, a lot of valid points. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I know we are um, uh, a little behind time, but uh, uh, please don't let that constrain you because we are looking forward to your presentation. You have uh, Professor Sri Radha Datta is, uh, needs no introduction really. And um, we uh, are eager to listen to your presentation and please don't feel constrained by uh, the clock. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Professor Singh. I think we'd met virtually earlier, and I'm so happy to meet you um, physically this time. And thank you, Professor Rajiv, of course. Nothing would have happened without you bringing us all together. So really excited and happy to be here. 
this was like a master class of Beamstech, honestly. And I have to thank Professor uh, Das, Dr. Das for this really, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Majinder also, and the other presentations. So I was just mulling over what I should do. I, I just thought, let me keep the niceties apart, because that you know, has been uh, something that we understand about Beamstech. I think the structural impediments that we have within the Bay of Bengal region, specifically for Bimstek, is actually what has come in our way. Uh, we have to address that physically. And this is not to say, and I know that Bimstek has taken off, it's been, what, 20 years to a uh, you know, charter being written, and now we are a document, vision document, which is going to happen again after two decades. So clearly, Bimstek was a slow child. But it has taken off, and I know for sure that it's because of India's uh, support. Uh, we've heard many times over the Thailand ambassador sitting in Delhi saying that, what is the hurry? I mean, I was wondering that which world are we living in? 20 years from now, and you're saying, what is the hurry? We will inch along. This is the exact words at one of the Chamber of Commerce meetings that I attended, and I asked him. So he says, no, things happen on its own. The momentum should gather. So I think I would say the Indian Prime Minister really took it on himself and you know pushed through. So whether you have the fusion center in uh, Gurgaon, which is basically an Indian Ocean center, but providing information to all the Bimstek countries in the Bay of Bengal, and the weather uh, center, which is NOIDA, which has done fabulous work, and I think has been a huge. So at a large level, governmental level, a lot of good things have happened quietly. But the issue here, and I, I won't touch on that, because I think Bimstek, and I think your city here, Mr. Mojimda, the government knows better at a larger level what to go ahead. And I know they, you are aware of the impediments much more than I do. Uh, but let me just look at the small issues. The first factor that comes to me, and not because I'm a woman, that the gender issue has been completely silent in Bimstek. None of the verticals that you've ever had, uh, which we see from the public domain of the Bimstek Charter, has ever mentioned gender. In 2024, we can't afford that anymore especially our BIMSTEC member uh, partners, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, are extremely sensitive about that, about the gender issue. So I'm, there is a, a whole lot that we can do in terms of adding value through them, uh, which has been a sector which we need to work. The other aspect, and I, I think I want to repeat myself here, is it's a fact that somebody, somebody has mentioned, and so has Vishwanjit, about how BIMSTEC has not become a household name. Even today, Sark or ASEAN is a household name. Uh, look at the BIMSTEC website. It's a website I should have thought of in 1970, not in 2024. Look at the dynamic websites which are available everywhere. It's not that no templates. It's not that we don't have the technology. It's not that we don't have the skill sets. But we have not thought that you know the website is enough. So I. Uh, and I completely agree, and which is, again, I'm so delighted and happy to be here because I think Nalanda is one of the first universities to have taken on Bay of Bengal as a center and, you know, move this apart, move this onward. Uh, so while I teach uh, some of these issues in my own class, uh, I, I hesitate to tell the kids that look at the official website because I know they'll be bored and they'll shut it down, and I, when I talk about BIMSTEC to them, they're going to blank out. So I try and you know do that. So I'm just saying that there are many ways that we can make them far more interactive. Today is a world for interaction. While the government may be doing whatever they are doing, and everybody has reasons of the way they you know react or respond, I think at another level we should take that furthermore. I'm going to give you a little example about how I was trying to build. Uh, like uh, Europe has an Erasmus education program. I was trying to build that in DBRM. And I take it from this other professor here who talked about Bhutan. And I'm going to again ask your, you and your office to see if you can get a contact with Bhutan University to take this forward. Nepal is on board. Sri Lanka is on board. Bangladesh is on board. I'm from OP Jindal. We are, of course, uh, trying to spearhead the program. It's nothing we just do. We are all of us are offering programs on international affairs, international studies, whatever you call it. Uh, you're going to start just now. So we are saying, and now there's so much of mobility happening, that why can't children move around from semester to semester and pick up a joint uh, program? And I think that's another way of allowing the children. Most of our family kids go to Europe and America for holidays. We don't take them to Bimstek countries. Why don't we allow them to you know, enable that system to see if we can 
had the, some countries need a little push. Uh, so even though uh, I do take this point about minilateral, but I think within BIMSTEC, even minilaterals are uh, doable. Uh, that's something we you know, need to look at because it's impossible to connect Nepal, Bhutan with Thailand. Uh, the point he made about Thailand, Myanmar, I've tracked that a little bit. They've had the similar insurgency issues that we face in all, the Manipur, uh, but they were able to transform that through many means and measures, not that India is not capable of those means and measures, but you know, how politics kind of takes over. Uh, which we are so constantly, we've talked about act peace policy and that's part of the BIMSTEC. Um, little bit of study that I've done on act peace policy, india ASEAN relationship has completely taken on another level, it's blossomed. But in terms of the roadways, the only one port that we have land port, which is the Moray, uh, and we know what happens at the Moray. The ICS, which is built, has only been used for people coming and going. Cargo has been completely stifled there. Uh, in terms of the Northeast, I've always been argued, and in my North Actis book, I've argued constantly that, that you know, the road transport system in the Northeast, because it's terrible, nothing else. It's pathetic. It's, you know, badly managed. I mean, I'm not even talking about the corruption at other levels, but I'm saying the weather, the terrain doesn't allow you for cargo movement to happen through the land. Uh, so you allow passenger movement. And even today, uh, we don't, we can't even think of a visa-free, you know, zone for the BIMSTEC. Earlier, you remember in SARC, we had tried that for a while. Things, of course, changed. In BIMSTEC, within the fact that we have a lot of, you know, bilateral positivity going on, at certain level, our trust factor is still very low. Uh, I'll give you the example of Sri Lanka. We have had a fantastic fusion center which we are supplying information to Sri Lanka too, but they went and built their own Sri Lankan uh, fusion center. So where does that go for us? India, Bangladesh, best of friends. Uh, but you know, in the last 10 years, you've done so much in terms of looking at multimodal cargo system. If you go back to the logistical partners, they will tell you they're still using the old system. Why? Because again, the point that was made, the hardware and the software is not connected. Uh, Akhara Agartala, we had big summit meeting, the two prime ministers flagging off. I can tell you there's no train which is going to move from there to there because it's a meter gauge, it's a broad gauge. We don't talk about it. We just want to say that yes, we have a vision. We certainly have a vision. But, and I think there's a new eminent persons group which has been established in BIMSTEC. I really wish they would have a team and look at the problems on the ground. You know, it's given the way Indian education system is and everybody else, ideation and vision is never a problem in the region. It is the implementation and on the ground factors. And the fact that BIMSTEC is, if you ask me 20 years or 25 years too late, is because we've not looked at the details and God is in details. Let's not ever forget that. So while on paper we have ticked off every box possible on the bilateral and then which is going to then network into a larger, you know, cobweb of transport system, nothing actually works. Uh, we signed an MDA, and I don't need to say this to you, informed audience, in 2015. Uh, why is there not a single movement of truck between Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, India? You know, we were sitting in many of the BBI and uh, tractor meetings, and the BB, uh, the Bhutan gentleman, usually some minister level or somebody would say, no environment, no this. And I personally have spoken to my MEA interlocutors, and I said they have a problem. Sri Radha, you're always picking problems. The problem is they talked about environment. Today, Nepal is talking about environment, but on the truth is that they're scared of Indian trucker. It's a clear mafia system that's on there. Why can't we address it? That guys share it. Our systems, our equipments are better, but we are not taking on open conversations. They go through the formal and they say, you know, the correct words. We say the same thing, which is why even today, from 2015, this is best of friends with Bangladesh and Nepal today, right? We can't have a better bilateral now, but even then we can't move on MDA. What does that tell us? Are we talking about a BIMSTEC multimodal transport? I mean, just for ticking the box, you want to do it? Please be my guest. But the point is that we have to get into details. I'm talking the trust factor. You know, Sri Lanka is now questioning our access to ports. They have given us Jaffna for those energy. Now, nobody was putting any money there. This government through Adani want to do this. But look at the kind of you know inflection that has come in. 
I have often, and I, I don't know why this has happened when I used to be at VIF, we used to be the uh, think tankers for, um, you know, partners for the security dialogue, which hasn't happened. Pandemic, of course, yeah. stymied this, and now we haven't had that. I sincerely believe that at the larger regional level, while other small issues will take place on the ground, and I think there are many people who could actually look into the detailing and bring out details for you in this as to what we address. A security framework is a basic. Uh, bottom line for us. I mean, we are constantly worried about what China is doing in Bangladesh, what Bang China is doing in Nepal, what is China doing in Sri Lanka. And then we are saying, that, oh, let's have FTA, oh, let's do this. No, there are two different oranges and apples here. So I know there'll be, there are lots of skepticism about having a security framework. We don't like the word because we think it's a Western orientation. But I believe a kind of a, our civilizational way of looking at security, and now we are, you know, using that very much so for our foreign policy endeavors, we should be able to bring that and get everybody on board in terms of a trust factor. You know, today we, um, the Indian mission um, issues the largest number of visas for across the board in the country to Bangladeshi, right, for medical and other things. Even today, my colleague from Dhaka University will take 45 days to get a visa for India. Now. For us, we have friends, so I just literally take my passport, sign, 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 the picture is done. You know, we don't even do the normal thing. They can't do that. The Indian High Commission in Bangladesh is overworked, I presume, because of the work. But if you see the line out, and, you know, outside that new place that they've built, I mean, what do you say? We don't treat our friends like this. We're not supposed to be treating. We are using these all these Kutumbakam words and world is unity, one. G20, all of that, but on the ground, how are we treating our friends? And then you say they don't trust us, or they do this to us. Of course they do this to us, because you also doing the same. I'm saying at a larger picture, away from office, away from the ministers, away from this, have franker conversations as to what is that they want out of us. And everybody, we are a larger economy, let's face it. There's nothing that we can do about that. We are geographically dominant, but they have concerns. Have we ever asked them? We always, you know, we know that certain things we can't help because they will take over a few things. But I'm just saying that even at the BIMSTEC, and again, I just want to, I don't know how much, I, uh, in terms of Act East, you know, Act East has done wonders in connecting the Northeast, fabulously. We had no railway tracks, we had nothing there. So today somebody from Tripura can actually easily come to Mizoram, which hadn't have happened earlier. Because the, but when we are looking at these, you know, there is, um, I think on the ground, I would say, in terms of using our ports, using our coastal system, we have Indian waterways, right? Uh, how many Indian coastal uh, ships use that? Nothing. It's only Bangladesh is using it. Uh, we've always talked about the fact, on paper from 2010, Mongla Chittagong port access, right? It's, again, it's been resurfaced and all of that. None of this is working. And are we not wondering why that's not working? Because there is a larger momentum on the ground where, you know, people who want to trade will trade, irrespective of what you offer to the ground. But when you are actually spending money, effort, whole lot of work is being done, and they are not, you know, being utilized, then what is the point? How many ICPs have you built in the area? And tell me how many are being used. So when those are the areas, and I would just say at the larger level at BIMSTEC, I think slow but steady. Uh, I don't think there's anything, um, I'm sorry, I think you use the word transformational at BIMSTEC. I'm not totally convinced anything transformational is going to happen, but I'm really going to be excited and happy if it does. BIMSTEC is a slow but steady thing. So large pictures is in place. But I would really think that, you know, getting a lot more things on the ground, and it doesn't need too much work. People like Sabya and people who are working on the ground can give those detailing, and about each one of us. I mean, like Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and we keep doing the South Asian, you know, uh, conference circuit all the time. Our problems remain the same. We've been here for the last 20, 30 years doing that. The problems haven't changed. They've just taken on a larger contour. And now when regionalism is something that India wants to believe, wants to push, wants to do, I think it's time we accept a bit of the issues on the ground, face them. And, you know, I'm saying in terms of sheer, I mean, how do I say this? This, you know, level of corruption that has taken over. Uh, this entire region, it's unhappy. I mean, it's sad to say, but it has because if you want to do trade through the legal way, 
it is such a problem. I mean, you know, the Moret Amu trade, if you look at the paperwork that you need to do, I have a high, you know, advanced college degree. I can't fill that form. So if I have to trade, which they do, head loads, they do informally. So it's a loss to us, right? Now, we're looking at the even the buses. We are looking at multimodal system coming in. The buses as their trucks, sorry, don't have container loads. We still send packages. Now, trains have to take container loads. So how do we mishmash that? And what about the software issues? Axle road, we know deliberately they've kept the axle road to 8.2. Ours is 10 plus. So our truckers and our buses can't go. So these are things that we have to talk. And you know, it's fine to, I mean, leaders need to sign summits and agreements and all of that. But I think on the ground and all of us sitting here obviously feel for the region. We want to do something. It's not about me being Indian or anything. I'm just saying that there's so much of potential. There's a natural affinity for all of us to work together. And I think, I mean, I'm happy to detail out many of those points on the ground which needs to be addressed for that those things to come in. A simple thing, like I said, a tourism. Thailand is, I think, seamless tourism is something we've learned from them. I said, why don't we do credit courses from them? Uh, you know, Indians are doing fabulously well. Entire Maldives, those entire hotel chains are done run with Maldives, Indian managers. So clearly we have that. Why are we not able to, but everything, the paperwork in the region is mind boggling. And you know, I've often, the first time I heard the word was single window clearance by Prime Minister Modi when he came in. I'm telling you, go to any of the ICPs, they don't even understand what that word means. So it's nice to use phrases, but can that percolate down to the ground? And I'm just saying that I think the Indian government has its vision clearly in place. It's, it's a steady way ahead. But the problems on the ground are something that can be handled, can be managed. And a lot of things in terms of how, you know, uh, I just, as I mentioned, there's a group, there's a, um, it's called BIMSTEC um, Marine Network, uh, which is based in Chennai, who just offered a fellowship to uh, BIMSTEC. People who are doing PhD can come join. They sent it out a week before the deadline. I mean, come on. So I'm just saying that even just NEA says to Jindal or to a university, OK, let's do a debate on BIMSTEC. I'll give you a 5,000 rupees award. It's a good way to keep churning. Every, every semester, all of us universities, people sitting here say, OK, one day we'll give it to BIMSTEC. One day we'll give it to Bay of Bengal. You know, let the children be part of this. I think until unless we take the youth with us, and in BIMSTEC, we are not taking the youth with us. At the higher level, good things are happening. There's no question about that. But we need the youth momentum to join the BIMSTEC process. And I think with very little money, it can be done at various levels. And I can reach out to other universities that I contact. And just even a small kind of a, you know incentive to a student, and they'll spend their heart, soul, and understanding what BIMSTEC is and what they can bring to the table. I'll close here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a, a very uh, clear-headed uh, expose of what the constraints are and uh, how even though you might have a vision, but translating that vision uh, into its subparts uh, demands that you go down right to the field and know at the granular level what the issues are, why they are so, and how they can be addressed. Often um, it is that it is a slow process of attrition. Uh, you know, when I was in Nepal, uh, we had a similar issue on uh, a simple thing like, uh, you know, Nepal needs uh, LPG. So LPG used to come in tankers. Um, but there was a great reluctance um, to get the Indian tankers there because the uh, uh, to open it up basically because in Nepal the customs duty on tankers was something like 300 percent so no Nepali could really afford to own a tanker so as a result it was only Indian tankers which were going which was also then a reason for great angst that you know the the whole trade is run by an Indian mafia but uh, the Nepalese just could not because they could not afford to compete with the Indians because their own customs duties on a tanker were so high so how do you address that, you know? So, uh, but at the same time, if we, if our tankers stop going, they would be without LPG, there would be a hue and cry. So uh, these are sometimes conundrums, but uh, you're right, they have to be solved in some way. And you're absolutely right about uh, 
you know, how we must get the youth involved, you know, and, uh, and to make um, them aware of our neighborhood and the potential that is there and how they can assist in um, understanding and uh, dealing with uh, many of those issues. On security, I'm happy to say that we will very soon have a security dialogue. Hmm? Um, and uh, that is planned sometime this month, I think. Um, Erasmus Plus kind of system, I think that's, uh, that's very, that's brilliant. And we should uh, have it. You said that we have, you have, OP Jindal has with uh, Sri Lanka. No, hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm. I see. Okay. I see. Okay. That is another issue I've taken up the Bhutanese ambassador then, apart from yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was uh, a very, very uh, another round of applause for all the all the speakers uh, who have each contributed uh, in a different way, in a different facet uh, to this very uh, rich uh, discussion that we had today. Thank you all very much. Um, I will now hand over back to Professor Abhay Kumar Singh or or to Ms. Professor Chaturvedi, either one of you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much, all the respected participants. I think this has been a big journey. And uh, like uh, what I enjoyed most sitting here is that uh, we have gone from the wider to the minutest point. And in the deliberations, I was just trying to pick up what as an education institution we may, we can do. So the first lesson that is that we can go into minute studies somewhere. And this, I expect that the Center of Bay of Bengal Studies would now be taking up such a view and uh, so that we can give you the points to the, to the government and to our colleagues, of course. Uh, this mismatching or the like not fitting, I find it mostly with the charges in, in the phones. So we have everything, but we can't uh, process things. The other important thing is uh, what I have, of course, learned sitting here is that there has to be a connectivity. The first connectivity should be between the scholars and the institutions in our own country and the think tanks and the government. So the quicker we are in passing on the messages and, and uh, exchanging our information, I think the better we would be in coming up to the to the uh, outside, the other partners in the country. So this has been a very uh, interesting and very important educative session. And uh, what I have again learned is that within time, a small time frame, so much can be discussed, which I feel that even a three-day seminar doesn't give us that much um, uh, ideas and suggestions and good advice. So I, from Nalanda University, all my colleagues here, of course it belongs to all of you, but still I would say that we are very, very honored with your presence and your participation. Uh, we are enriched with your learned views and uh, of course your, your guidance and your suggestions, we value very much, we'll, we've noted it down and uh, uh, hopefully we would come out We'll come out with a good report on that, what, what we have uh, deliberated today in this colloquium. And then with this, I think that the best would be to have another day for us to go further. And sir, we would request like you and all the other participants to keep your kindness and gracious attitude towards us whenever we request you. please spare time for us and uh, I think that Nalanda would be fulfilling some part of its uh, duties and the roles by going this way. So Rajivji, I, I would like you to thank everybody formally. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, on behalf of Center for Bay of Bengal Studies and Nalanda University, 
um, I thank all of you. First, uh, I am grateful to the Secretary East Ambassador uh, Jaydeep Majumdarji for his sparing time and chairing the entire session. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we got uh, a lot of material, and I will prepare a report and share with your office. Um, I also thank all the speakers who came all the way here for this session and enriched our knowledge and share their wisdom with us. I also thank all our um, faculty uh, members, colleagues, our uh, non-teaching staff, our support team, and registrar who is not here at the moment, but uh, from the behind, uh, he supported, provided all the support uh, necessary for uh, arranging this colloquium. So uh, I thank Registrar sir and entire uh, Nalanda University team and most importantly our students who are listening quietly behind, sitting behind, but they have learned a lot from this. So thank you everyone.